I'm going to go quickly through these objectives, but the main objective today is to get you using IMAP, understanding what plants to look at out in the ecosystem, and at the end, connect to volunteer opportunities. There's also a really fun challenge going on that we're going to talk about because everything's better with friendly competition. So what do I mean by invasive? It's complicated. This is something you've all heard the phrase, you know, oh, it's invasive, oh, it's native. But what does that mean? And are we putting something, are we putting value judgments on that? Is this good? Is this bad? Is this scary? Is this not scary? Um, and there's a lot of nuance to how we determine our priorities. So we have on this screen, we've got a couple different boxes. We have this hexagonal, you know, matrix of native species. These are things, these are plants, animals, soil microbes, uh, you know, invertebrates, giant trees, everything that's evolved to work together and balance each other with a certain climate in a specific geography. Um, I'm not going to go into the definition and, you know, deep understanding of what it means to be a native species because species also travel across geographies as well, right? Like a monarch will go from near the North Pole to Mexico, but they're still native to our area. Then we've got the definition of non-native. So this might, you also might hear the phrase exotic or introduced. This is kind of a a low threat, low priority level. Um, a lot of plants in people's gardens are non-native. Cucumbers are non-native. Watermelons are non-native. Tomatoes are native to North America. Um, but we're not really terrified of watermelons getting out into the ecosystem and destroying habitat. Um, so it depends. I have here California poppies, which are also from North America. However, they're not native to east of the Rockies. Then we've got our invasive species, and these are also called noxious species. So noxious is also kind of a loaded term, but these are the species we're really going to talk about and focus on, and that's what APIP focuses on in its work. So these are non-native, but they also have high threats to the environment, to you know, ecosystem processes, to environmental concerns that have to do with, say, human health or also um, economic viability of crops or activities. Um, and it, I'm going to go a little deeper into this. And what's funny is this lupin that I've pictured here, this is also native to North America. However, it's also not native to east of the Rockies. So where I just moved from in Oregon, this type of lupin, a big leaf lupin, is actually planted by restoration ecologists. We want it on the landscape. It is an amazing pollinator plant. Um, and it actually brings a lot of nitrogen into the soil, which helps fertilize for other plants. But on this side of the Rockies, it's problematic in that it you know, really dominates a habitat. It displaces other species. It displaces plants that pollinators need, and it changes soil chemistry. It's also not a long-lived plant. So when these guys, if they take over an entire ecosystem um, or habitat or landscape, and then die back in two or three years, nothing's left. So soil can't be held together. Um, the soil chemistry has changed because it's, it's in the, the bean family, it's in the pea family. So it actually brings nitrogen from the atmosphere into the soil. Um, and we, ha we can have a lot of erosion issues. And then we've got nuisance species. They're here. They're not going anywhere. We're not doing anything. But they're really not an issue. So it kind of, kind of relates back to that non-native but it's not making an impact. So a nuisance species like dandelions, I, I think they've been in North America for probably five or 600 years. Um, and they can be a real annoying plant to have in your garden that you have to weed out, but it's not making an ecosystem impact like an invasive species is. So I know that's complicated. I'm here to answer questions about it afterwards. But what's important is these three bullets. 
Go ahead, Mitch. Oh, um, I was just going to, there's some comments in the chat box about um, Lupine um, or Lupin. So a lot of us are more familiar with uh, like Lupin and uh, Corner Blues and everything. So I just want to mention that there are different species of this plant. Um, and so the one you mentioned is invasive, but not all species of Lupin are invasive. No, there's hundreds, if not over a thousand different types of lupin in North America. They are one of my top favorite plants. And so that's also why I brought it up. And also this big leaf lupin, the, the leaves are like this big. So when you see it, it's a big leaf lupin. It's also one of my favorite plants in Oregon. So I'm super bummed to know that I can't and should not plant it here. Um, so I'll, you'll have to teach me about all the cool lupin that are up here in the Adirondacks. Um, but going back to those bullets, the biogeographical context, where is it? Ask yourself that question. Is it making an, is it an issue here? Is it an issue in another state? Is it an issue in our region? Is it an issue in this lake? So that is very important to think about. It's a big gray area. Like honeybees, for instance, they are not native. They're European honeybees, but we can't do anything without them. So they're not making it a, a huge, you know, they're not, they're, they're benefiting us, but they're not native. I would also say with the biogeographical context, um, lake trout are a good example. They're awesome fish. They live in the Great Lakes. They're valued. Uh, they're fun to eat. They're fun to catch. Um, but they're highly invasive and problematic in Yellowstone National Park, for instance. And then thinking about that environmental harm, what's happening? Is it, with the dandelion example, is it destroying an entire ecosystem? No, okay. Is it annoying to pull out of your garden? Yeah, so what's, or no, right? You can make a tea out of it. So it has to constantly be questioned. Um, diverse native benefits, or the benefits of native ecosystems are countless and priceless. Um, I don't want to take up all of our time today talking about this um, because I could, I definitely could. But we've talked about providing food to wildlife and pollinators and people. We've talked about um, creating shelter and rearing habitat, right? Native plants in, in aquatic ecosystems, that's, you know, that's shelter for being, for hiding from predators, it's shelter for rearing your young. Uh, producing oxygen, pretty important to our entire lives. Um, storing, filtering, and protecting drinking water, pretty important to our entire lives. Like the Adirondacks and Catskill State Park are really protecting drinking water for the state. Cycling greenhouse gases, I would say that's pretty beneficial. Um, the Adirondacks are known as an amazing carbon sink, not just for New York State, but for the entire Northeast, which is in, you can't even put a dollar amount on that. Stabilizing sediments, so I got into that a little bit with the lupin before. If you push out all native plants, what is going to hold soil systems together? They're not making more of it. We need our soil, it's also a carbon sink. And then it's also an economic engine up here in the Adirondacks. It's timber production in some cases, but it's mostly tourism in others. We want to have beautiful water to swim in, to fish in, to drink to enjoy. Um, but there's also um, foods come from biodiverse habitats, medicines come from biodiverse habitats. Um, research is actually a huge economic driver. Um, if we're preserving and conserving land, we're also paying contractors, we're paying um, printing companies, we're paying for t-shirts. It's a big um, trickle-down world with research. Agriculture relies on diverse pollinators and healthy soils. And also, it's enjoyable. I like botanizing. You like botanizing. We all like botanizing. Potential impacts. I think we're aware of a lot of these already. Um, biodiversity loss from competition or allelopathy. So that's when an invasive plant, and one of the plants we'll talk about today, actually exudes chemicals to kill plants around it. So Tree of Heaven does this famously. So if you find it, 
Please report it in IMAP invasives and never put it in your compost. Um, food web disruptions can, you know, go from anything from losing a fish forever, like, sa like specific salmon, like where I lived in Oregon, or um, losing food systems for wildlife. We've talked about erosion and soil loss, but on the other side of that, you've got sedimentation into aquatic systems. You've got human health impacts. There's a number of invasive species potentially entering into the Adirondacks that can actually burn your skin. Um, but there's also allergies that increase, like with um, the number of uh, flowering trees that might be blooming at a certain time in a certain place. Um, it has a huge impact, and that's actually an issue starting to come up more and more in Long Island and down in the city where people are realizing the size and age of invasive trees are really destroying people's allergies. You can really lose quality of drinking water. This can never be replaced with filtration. The work that a healthy forest can do is incredibly valuable for protecting drinking water. And then climate resiliency. We don't even know the price tag of ecosystem value that a healthy, diverse, resilient forest can protect us for a change in climate. Um, I could go on and on and on, but this is, this, this is another big point of research for our office in the Adirondacks with the Nature Conservancy. So what can we do to maintain all these benefits that I just discussed and avoid all of the very huge real threats that I just discussed? APIP works to do two things very well. The first is prevention strategies. If we don't bring it in, we don't have a problem. So let's keep it boring, right? Keep it boring. I love boring. Um, if we're doing everything we need to do to protect our ecosystems while we're hiking, while we're gardening, while we're farming, while we're boating, we can keep these species out of these native habitats. And the Adirondacks are very, very unique um, in their native composition and very, very important to practice prevention methods all the time. The second thing we can do, which APIP does, which we do with IMAP, is called early detection, rapid response. I mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again and I'll keep going with it. If we can detect if these species are here early, if it's just one plant, if it's just one snail, if it's just one, you know, little bloom of hemlock woody adelgid, we have the human, financial, and logistical resources to take care of it. This is one, uh, this is just one plant, but it can take over an entire wetland. It happens. So I've worked in wetland restoration and the amount of herbicides that would be required to take out this much purple loosestrife would be impossible. And the health effects and environmental effects, let alone the cost um, and opportunity for conservation, it's we'll just lose this ecosystem. So the best thing we can do is make sure it doesn't happen. And we have proven results in the Adirondacks. We've had European frog bit here. We caught it early, we removed it. We've had Eurasian milfoil here. We've caught it early with volunteers and removed it. Loon Lake with water chestnut. Volunteers found it, it was removed. Lake Alice water chestnut was found by volunteers and removed. So it's you all who are the eyes and ears of the APIP of the Adirondacks as you're out paddling, as you're vacationing, as you're fishing, it all relies on you to be the eyes and ears. And so I'm really glad you're here today. So that took 20 minutes longer, Mitchell, but it's your turn. I'm sorry, um, no matter okay. how fast I talk. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and I'm gonna let you, you take over. Thank you for all of that overview. I'll just take a second for my screen to share. Uh, 
Uh, so, as I mentioned before, I'm with the New York Natural Heritage Program. My name is Mitchell O'Neill, um, and we do a lot of work with uh, trying to conserve biodiversity in New York State. Uh, our focus is providing comprehensive information, so taking uh, surveys and data. Um, so we do a lot of work surveying for rare species and natural ecosystems, um, but we also recognize that invasive species can have a huge impact on biodiversity. So we also have the Invasive Species Database Program. And so we're, our biggest project is probably IMAP Invasives, but we also do some other work, including WISPA, which is the um, application that boat stewards use. So if you any of you boat or go to boat launches, you might see boat stewards. Um, they're tracking aquatic invasive species, and we're involved with that. Um, so um, we just discussed all the nuances here. Um, so you might be familiar with how sort of complicated this invasive species definition is. Um, this is a super simplified version. Um, so essentially, you can think of invasive species as species that are non-native. Um, there can be a lot of nuance there too, but in like a very simple example, it would be um, somewhere from outside of New York State, if we're thinking about New York State. And then um, there are a lot of non-native species in any given area, but not all of them are considered invasive. So to be considered invasive, it has to have some sort of negative impact. So some non-natives have these negative impacts, which include harm to environment, economy, and human health, like we discussed earlier. And um, so these invasives are a huge problem, but what can we do about them? Um, so a lot of research and theory has gone into this. Um, one of the main thoughts is that how we deal with invasive species depends on where they are in this invasion curve. Um, and in general, we like to be early on in the invasion curve. So um, if it's not here yet, or it's only here in a couple populations, we have the resources to uh, address it, either by prevention or eradication. Um, as it becomes more widespread, it takes a lot more effort to manage it, and we're not gonna get as much bang for our buck because um, we're not gonna be as successful. Um, and one cool thing about the Adirondacks is we're really in this prevention eradication for a lot of species. There are some where we're in the containment and management, um, but compared to a lot of other areas, especially um, like Southern New York, um, there are a lot of species that have not become widespread in the Adirondacks yet. Um, and so to understand how to manage invasive species, we really need to understand what their current distribution is. As, it, as an example of what that looks like, here's Tree of Heaven's distribution in New York State. So these orangish squares represent places where it's been recorded in IMAP invasives. Um, you can see it's um, pretty it's pretty easy to find in Pennsylvania, southern New York, Long Island, and even this stretch of the like, western New York and the Finger Lakes. Um, it is not found in the Adirondacks yet, but that could change. Um, so the question is kind of these blank spaces. What's going on there? Are these data gaps or are these places where it's truly not found? In the case of the Adirondacks, of heaven is associated with more urban areas, um, it's pretty likely that tree of heaven is not going to be widespread like it is in other parts of the state. But it's still good to go out and look for this species because it makes the species distributions change, species spread, so we always need to be looking out. And sort of to fill this need for invasive species distribution data, um, we've been managing IMAP invasives. So IMAP invasives is used by several different jurisdictions across North America. So a couple of states and one Canadian province. In New York, we use it as the centralized invasive species database to support PRISMs like APIP and state agencies and other partners working on invasive species issues. And so the main uh, services that IMAP invasives provides are 
uh, species distributions and reports. Um, our system also allows for early detection alerts. So if one of you was out in the field and you found an invasive species and reported it, um, someone on the APIP team will probably get an email so they'll know about it right away and be able to respond, especially if it's one of those high priority species. Um, we have these web map services, which allows our data to be um, used live in a number of programs. And uh, we allow for tracking control efforts and results. And so where does all the data come from in this database? In the beginning, it was really important uh, to have these existing data sets. Um, so different agencies, land water managers, researchers at universities, museums, um, they've been recording data on invasive species for a long time. Um, APIP's been around since 1998. Um, so the first step was getting all these different databases that are existing on like on uh, hard drives or sometimes in paper or in herbarium records, um, compiling all that and getting that into one big database. And so that provided a really good snapshot of invasive species distributions at the time of, that those data were collected. Um, but we are constantly finding out about new invasive species. Invasive species are spreading to new areas. Um, so for this database to be useful, we really rely on data entered by community scientists and professionals across the state. So everyone on this call is a really important data source for New York invasive species efforts. And I have a little icon of a phone there. Um, because, so to recognize that importance, we've made this app so that anyone can record invasive species. Um, so anyone across the state uh, can report an invasive species to the database. Um, whether they are a professional botanist or a volunteer, um, everything goes into the database unconfirmed, and then a second person um, who has species ID experience needs to go in and uh, review that report and confirm it. And that's just to ensure data quality. And so I'm, I'm going to to go into how to use IMAP Invasives in the mobile app. But before, I just want to put in a little plug for this mapping challenge that we're running right now for three weeks. Um, it's, so it started last week, so it's two weeks now. Um, and so just to frame what that is, um, it's called the Invasive Species Mapping Challenge, the citizen science effort that we started in 2016, the goal well, the first goal is to fill in data gaps for a couple of species that we select. And then the second more long term goal is just to generally build our user group and equip them uh, to monitor and report invasive species because citizen scientists are so important in invasive species efforts. And so on the right, I have pictures of our four species. Um, Oh, yes. Yeah. So in the next slide, I'll show you what their distributions are. Um, you already saw the Tree of Heaven distribution. Um, as another example, uh, water chestnut. Um, it's found in a lot of the state in the Adirondacks. It's been um, surveyed for, but not found pretty often. Um, but as mentioned before, it has been found before. And since it was found um, in small in just like small patches or individual plants, they've been able to address the species and remove it. Um, and those are volunteers that found those. And European frogbit, a similar story. And one thing I'll note here is that it's pretty prevalent in the St. Lawrence River area and sort of the Champlain River area. And it's been found in a couple places in the Adirondacks. So this again, even though most of the Adirondacks it's not found, um, it is something that pops up and can continue to pop up. So it's something to keep an eye out for. I will add that and, um, so our territory does go over to Lake Champlain. And I know we have people on this call who are in Westport. So it's definitely something we need to keep an eye on because a lot of boats go from Lake Champlain to Scroon Lake. To Lake George and then into lakes right further into the park. Mm -hmm. 
that was my cat, if you all <laughs> heard that, sorry about that. Um, and yeah, there's also uh, frog bits found in Saratoga Lake, and there are a lot of people who boat in Saratoga Lake and the Adirondacks, so that's another potential vector. Um, another good reason to clean, drain, and dry boats when switching lakes. Um, and then for jumping worm, um, this one, this species, um, I hadn't really heard about it until maybe last year. It's something that's been on our radar for maybe less time than something like water chestnut. Um, so the data is more limited. It's a, it's a very patchy distribution. We're not really sure what the full extent of this species is. Um, and there was a comment about earthworms in the chat box before, so I'll just mention that um, for the most part, uh, worms in New York State are not native. Um, so because of the history of glaciation, um, there's like a, a line that goes across North America, kind of from New York, Southern New York, all the way across where um, earthworms are, there's native earthworms, native North American earthworm communities are found south, like in Pennsylvania and the south. Um, but north of that, like in New York, State and Canada, native earthworm communities are very, very, very rare. Um, so most of the worms that we see are not native. And there are two main waves. So there's the um, European wave of invasion. So the, there's European worms. Um, those are pretty widespread. Um, they do have impacts on soil and forests, but they're not something we are as concerned about because they're already widespread. There's not much we can do at this point. But jumping worm is, at least we don't think it's as widespread. So this is part of a second uh, wave of invasion of Asian worms. So it's Asian jumping worms. Um, so these are the species that, the worm species that we're really concerned about. Um, so this is a good species to look out for. It's one of the distinctive qualities of this worm is that it like, jumps and snakes around, and that's why it's called jumping worm. And that was a very simplified explanation. I'm not a worm expert. Um, so uh, we did have a webinar on this challenge, and it included a presentation on jumping worm from a researcher at Yale University. Um, so she is a really great resource, and I encourage you to all uh, view her presentation if you're interested. And I can show you where to find that later on. I would say also, Mitch, like to get started learning about these worms as soon as possible so that we can win this challenge, because yeah. we can win this challenge in Adirondacks. <laughs> um, I'll share with you that talk from the, the Yale Environmental School of Forestry researcher, um, and then APIP is going to host another workshop about this later in August because these creatures don't have like a short window of time we can get them from you know last frost to first frost which is you know relatively long but for the adirondacks maybe relatively short um and their eggs can overwinter so it's a i love talking about worms and will put myself on mute now <laughs> thank you Um, and so how to participate. It's a three week long challenge. Um, today will be the start of week two. So there's two more weeks. Um, so basically, you go out and look for the four focal species. Um, if you want more guidance on identifying these species, um, you can view our webinar that I mentioned earlier. And I'm sure APIP also has identification resources. And some of these species might have been mentioned in the earlier two workshops. Um, and then you report these observations to IMAP and bases. And so, as you saw in the dis distributions, all four of these species are probably the most rare in the Adirondacks, just given um, just a lot of characteristics of the Adirondacks. Um, just the environment's different. Um, there have been people surveying for invasive species for such a long time there that it's the, pretty much the most, the least invaded area in the state. 
Um, but that does not put you at a disadvantage because even if you don't find the species, if you go out and look for it, so if you go to your local pond and look for water chestnut or European frog bit, even if you don't find it, you can still report a not detected record, basically saying that you surveyed for it but did not find it. And so then that will count towards the challenge. And so how the challenge works um, for each species, the top contributing individual will be a first place winner. So the person who reports the most jumping worm will be the jumping worm winner. Um, normally, <laughs> uh, normally we, we buy gifts for the winners. Um, this year we're not able to buy gifts because of uh, COVID budget restrictions, but we are still trying to pull together some uh, gifts. So for jumping worm, it'll probably be gardening related um, for Tree of Heaven, it'll be some spotted lanternfly uh, swag from the Department of Lands and Forests, or no, sorry, from the Department of Ag and Markets. Um, but we are still working on that. I can't promise you anything in particular for the first place winners, um, but for the prisms, uh, prisms also win. So whichever prism reported the most jumping worm, for example, um, would get a trophy. And so there's this pot with worms on it, jumping worm trophy, and this could go to APIP if um, there are enough reports. And so I'll show you later where you can find the leaderboard and some live maps of the data that goes in. So just think about um, this challenge as I go forward. Um, so now I'll go into how to use IMAP invasives. So there's these two main components. There's the online web application and the mobile app. So the online web application is where the whole database is. You can access it on the web uh, through a browser-based interface. So you, it's basically, it's a website, imapinvasives.naturesurf.com, and that's where you see all of the data. Um, but it says it's a website. You can only use that when you have internet. And so that's not, exactly the most useful for when you are out in the field somewhere like the Adirondacks um, and you don't have service and you um, somewhere remote looking for invasive species. Um, so we also have this mobile app and this allows you to collect simple data so uh, point data presence or not detected and it's on your phone and you don't need to be in internet connectivity um, to use it once you've set it up. So you can go out into the field and report invasive species. And so the first thing you have to do to use this whole system is to bake an account. And you do that on the online web application. So even if you're only gonna use the mobile app, you do need to set up your account first on the website. And in general, I recommend um, Chrome or Firefox. Safari also works if you're on a Mac or an iPhone. Um, but Internet Explorer does not work. And one thing, I, one distinction I do want to make clear is that this online web application can be accessed on your phone. So if you go into your browser, um, you can get to it there, but it's still different from the mobile app. That's a separate app, not in your internet browser. Okay. So for those of you who have not um, made IMAP accounts, I encourage you to try to follow along here. Um, you could access the, you'll go first go to this website. Um, you can do this on your phone if you still want to be looking at your screen. Um, and there are also instructions on how to do this online if you uh, run into any issues and you can also ask us. Um, so I always go to nyimapinvasives.org. This is um, New York's website for IMAP Invasives. Um, this is where you can find a lot of other help resources, um, but there's this login and create account button on the top right. And so that will bring you to imapinvasives.natureserve.org. And there's these two parts on this page. So if you have an account, you log in, you know your information, um, put in your email and password, 
And if you forgot your password, you can click forgot password and that'll help you reset it. Um, I think I heard someone at the beginning say they, they, they set up IMAP a while ago, but maybe haven't logged in in a while. Um, so for people who haven't signed in since last spring, even if you know your password, you will have to click this forgot password button. It's sort of how we reset the account um, since we did an update in like April last year. So that's just one thing to be aware of. And then if you have not made an account, you use this box down here to create an account. So you put in your name and email, make a password, and then at the bottom, uh, there's this jurisdiction. So you pick New York State as your jurisdiction. Um, and then once you hit join, it'll send an email to your account. Um, and so the email that you listed, check the inbox. Sometimes it ends up in your spam or your junk mail, so make sure to check that too. It's uh, from IMAP Invasive will be the email address. Um, and it'll have a link in there to our user agreement. Um, so that'll have like the terms and conditions of the app. So once you read that and accept, then you'll be able to log in. Um, hey Mitchell, I know some of, yeah? Question. Um, one person, their app is frozen on their phone and they downloaded it last year. But I know that there was an update. And so when we're at a certain point, can you talk about updating the app if you had it on your phone? Because I know a few people yeah. are returning to this training. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely uh, mention that in a little bit when I move into the app. Um, but for the app to work, the first thing you, for to, make, to have the app work for you, the first thing you need to do is make sure your online account works. Um, so some of you might still be um, waiting for an email or typing in your information. I just wanna open the chat box so I can see some of the comments coming in. Um, so, but while you're waiting for that, I'll give you a brief orientation of like what it looks like when you log in. So it always has this pop-up. Um, it'll say when it was last updated. And once you get yourself up to date, if you wanna read any of the information, um, they usually have a release page that you can click on and you, it'll show you like all the new updates. Um, so once you close that out, there's this main map which shows you all the data so you can see we're not just new york we have some other locations like uh pennsylvania maine florida arizona oregon and a canadian province um so on the top left yes um so on the top left there's the main menu and i'm in an internet browser now not the app um, so in the main menu is the top left icon. Below that are some navigation tools. So this is where you can zoom in and out. Um, you could put in a, your town in this little search one and that'll bring zoom into your town. There's these action tools on the top. And then there's these uh, geographic layers on the right. And so these are all tools that are for you if you're interested in them. You don't necessarily need to understand how to use everything on the website to be able to report species on the app. I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. Um, and so once you have your account and you're able to log in, you're really all set. Um, there are some additional features I'm gonna show you briefly. So if you go into the main menu, um, one of the options is your account. So this is where you can see all of your information. Um, so the top boxes will have your information. And then below, um, you'll have your organizations and projects. So if any of you, actually I'll explain what those are next. Um, so if any of you are doing invasive species surveys or management work as a part of your job duties, usually you join your employer's organization so that all of your records are associated with your organization. 
Um, for citizen scientists and volunteers, you do not need to join an organization. And then there's this other thing called projects in IMAP Invasive. Um, these are great ways to group data for projects or certain grants, um, great for volunteers. Um, an example would be mapping efforts across organizations or PRISM coordinated volunteer efforts. Um, so Emily Bell is actually going to make a project and add EPIP uh, citizen scientists to it. Um, so you won't have to worry about this next step anytime soon, but if um, you ever want to join another project or if you need to join your organization, I'll briefly show you how you can do that. So um, on that Your Account page that you access to the main menu, there's an edit button on the top right. And then once you hit that, you can scroll down to, um, depending on what you want to join, the organization or the project box, and then click this Request to Join button. And then type in whatever organization or project it is and then select it from the options, and then click this Request to Join button. And then another important part is to scroll back up, and this Edit button will now be a Save button with a floppy disk, so make sure you click that to save your changes, and then you will appear as a pending member until the admin accepts your request. And so you don't need to worry about this for the project uh, that's being made for APIP um, because Emily Bell is going to join, uh, add you guys in. So that's just something to know for the future. Um, and one more feature on the website I want to show you before we do the app is you can set up email alerts. Um, so there are some, well, actually, I'll first I'll say these were created so that state officials and PRISMs can be alerted to new observations. Um, so, for instance, so that APIP knows whenever um, a key species is found in the Adirondacks. Um, but really, everyone can use these alerts. So there are some, so in the main menu, you go to your email alerts, and then you'll be brought to a page with your email alerts. And on top are some general alerts that you can opt in and out of. Um, for instance, so this first one, Right now, my email is turned off for don't alert me when a record I created has been updated. I've actually changed this since then because it's, um, it's fun to see when your, if your uh, record has been updated. So if someone goes in, reviews your record, confirms it, you would get an email telling you that it's been confirmed. Um, and then the second one, alert me when a presence record I created is the first of its species in the region. So that's cool to know too um, if, the, if you have found a plant and it, you get this email, that means like um, this is an early detection, really, because it hasn't been found in this region before. So that's really important. Um, and then you can also do these custom alerts, such as, um, for an example, you could do European frog bit in a pip. Um, so if you're interested in a specific species or um, like aquatic plants or something like that, you can set up an alert for that species or that group of species for some geography. So you could do your county, your prism, et cetera. And this is all optional. So the only required part is the making the account, um, adding organizations and projects and email alerts. Um, those are just extra features that you can take advantage of if you're interested. And so now, um, hopefully, um, People are able to sign in to IMAP Invasive. They've been able to make an online web app. Uh, sorry, you've been able to make your account on the online web application. Um, so now we can move to the mobile app. And feel free to type any questions into the chat box. So the mobile app, um, you can find it in your app store, whether that be uh, your Apple App Store or Google Play, and download and download it. Um, so some of you might have an old version. Um, so you can go into the App Store and search it. And instead of, it won't say download or anything like that. Instead, it will say update. So if you press the update button, you can update the app. 
And while you're all finding the app on your device, um, so either your tablet or your smartphone, um, I'd like to describe the workflow as a sandwich in terms of connectivity. So to set up your account, which you just did, and to set up your, adapt your app, which we will do, you need internet connection or at least a good service. Um, and then, so that's sort of the top slice of bread. And then in the, the middle of the sandwich, you don't need connectivity. So you can go out into the Adirondacks and record invasive species, even if you don't have service. But at that point, the records will be all sitting on your phone. To get them into the online database, you have to upload them. So once you get back home or to your office and you have connectivity again, then you have to do this bottom slice of bread and upload your records to IMAP in connectivity. So I'll go through those uh, three steps, starting with this one. And I'll switch over to my tablet to do this live. And basically, um, so I'll share my screen. And basically, I'll be going through these three steps. So set the preferences, which will set up the app, pretty much connects your app to your online account. Um, we'll record an observation of fake species. We've made this fake species in the database so that people can do test records. I use it all the time. And then we're going to upload these fake observations. So I just need to share my tablet screen. All right, so now you can see my tablet. Give me one second. Okay. Uh, so, first thing you have to do is find your app. Let me just pull up my slides that help guide me through this so I don't miss anything. All right, thank you. So the um, first thing you do is find your app. It's that same little leaf icon with the, I think it's an Asian monk, or no, I'm actually not sure which insect that is. It's too small for me to see, but there's a little insect flying around the leaf. So you click on the app. And the first screen will look like uh, for some of you, it might look different, so just hold on a second. For those of you who have already gone into this app, it'll look like this. Um, you just need to click away those instructions after you've uh, taken a look at them. Uh, some of you will automatically be in the preferences section um, if this is the first time you're opening app. For those of us who are not, we have to navigate to it. So on the top left, there is a menu icon with three bars. So if you click on that, it brings up some options. And so I'm going to click Preferences. So here is where you put in your information. So you'll pick New York for jurisdiction. Um, put in your email, the same one that you used. And then enter in your password. And these have to match what you used um, online exactly for it to work. And then what you do is you press this retrieve IMAP list button. So it's green in the middle. In the screen share, it might not look as green as it is in on your actual screen, but click that retrieve IMAP list button. And so this is doing a call to the website um, as and going to your account and pulling in any projects or organizations, et cetera, that you are a part of. And it'll pull in the species list for New York State. Um, so hopefully you get this green success message. Um, sometimes you'll get a red error message. Um, usually that's from some sort of uh, the password or email not matching the website exactly. Um, so make sure you're able to log in on the website with your username and password. 
um, and also uh, maybe retype the password to make sure there's no typos. Um, one thing that happens sometimes on iPads and iPhones is it adds in a space because it thinks you're trying to type in a sentence. So you'll type in your password and then we'll put a space. Um, so just make sure that's not happening. Um, so once you've got that success message after hitting retrieve list, you are good to go. You should be able to record. You should be able to go out into the field without internet connection and record species. Um, but there are some additional features that you might want to take advantage of. Um, so I leave species display, display on common. I think that's easier. Um, under that, there's this customized species list. So if you click that button, it brings up the full invasive species list for New York State. And you can see I'm scrolling down and I'm still in the A's. So this is a very long list. Um, I don't know what every single one of these species is. Um, so I pick the species that I know how to identify and that I'll be surveying for. Um, so like at, when you, so here's big leaf lupine, which I was discussed earlier, for example. Um, now I know more about that species, so I'll add that in. Um, and you can go through and pick out ones that you are interested in. Um, you can pick out the ones from the challenge. Maybe I'll do that real quickly just to show you. So let's see what the first one is. Oh, actually, I haven't added them in this one. So alphabetically, let's see, the first one will be European frog bit. Go down to ease, and I'll pick European frog bit. OK, I already selected that one. Um, next, I'll actually go to the S. So fake species is really important um, to add that in. Oh, and I should mention, so the reason why we're going through this long list um, is that so when you're in the field and you're recording an observation, um, when you need to select your species, if you don't make a custom species list, it'll pull up this huge list that you'll have to scroll through. Scroll through. If you pick the species um, you're interested in first, then you'll have a smaller list to work from. Um, so European frog bit next, I'll do jumping worm. So down to the J's. But in jumping worms. Um, next will be Tree of Heaven. We'll go down to T's. Make sure Tree of Heaven is selected. There it is. And Water Chestnut. Okay. Oops. Um, and then, so the rest of the defaults, you can usually leave as they are, or at least this section of them. Um, you can change your pix picture quality. The default is 50. You can move it up to 100 for better pictures. Um, but you don't really have to worry about uh, these next couple of settings. At the bottom, um, you can make a default project. Um, so if you go, if you click on that, it'll list the projects that you're a part of. Um, so right now, it'll probably not come up with anything for most of you. Um, but once you're added to the project, um, you'll go back into preferences. Actually, I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, so I'll just press save to save all the changes, to save your species list and everything. And so say uh, this weekend, um, you want to go out. Um, You've got an email saying that you've been added to the project and everything, and you want to make sure your project is in your IMAP app. So what you do is you'll go back into preferences. So click the top left, hit preferences, and hit retrieve IMAP list again. So this will do another call to the website. And at that point, you will be part of this new project. So you can add it in as your default project here and save answers. And so now um, we can record a fake observation. So there's a green button at the top right that says add observation with little plus. 
So I'll click that. And this brings you into the add observation screen. Um, the first thing it asks you to do is take a photo. That's because pictures are really important. That's how we um, verify the record. So if it's a picture you already took, you can do select photo from library. Um, or you can take a photo using the camera. Checking to see if my cat was here, so you can see her, but she's not. So I'll just take a picture of my computer and then press check to say that I'm done. And now the picture appears on my observation screen. And then, so next, you can see this check mark for custom species list. So if I leave it checked, I get this uh, list of species that's easier to manage. Um, so I'm going to select fake species, and you can all do the same. So fake species. This might look a little bit different for people on iPhones. This is an Android device, but the workflow should be the same. Um, say I went to this, say I was in the field and I saw, um, Say I saw Phragmites and I wanted to record it, and it's not in my custom species list. So I could uncheck custom list, and then I would get the full species list, and then I can find whatever um, this new species is. And if I start finding Phragmites a lot, I could always go back into preferences um, and add it to my custom species list. So don't worry if you haven't check through every single species that you want in your custom species list. Um, you'll still be able to report other species and you can always change your custom species list. I am going to choose fake species. And then um, the next is species detected, species not detected. Um, I usually focus on species detected um, for the Adirondack. It's pretty likely that uh, you'll be recording more species not detected records than most of the states. So I'll click species not detected just for fun. Um, the date will automatically pull right now, so you don't have to worry about that. And then it'll show you this map so you can see where you are. Um, as you can see, I live near Saratoga Lake. Um, so if you're out um, on a trail somewhere in the Adirondacks with no service, this might not really show up. It might be a blank gray screen for the map. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not working. That just means it's not pulling the like, map visuals. So the thing you want to check is this uh, location underneath the map. So it has latitude and longitude, actually longitude, then latitude. Um, and if that's a long number, decimal and everything, um, that means it's collecting your geographic location. If you get zero, zero here, um, that's usually because um, there's something on your phone, like you have denied permissions somewhere. Um, your IMAP app has not been given permission to track your location. Um, so that's something you'll need to fix in your settings. Um, and I, I promise you can you can click the allow for this. Um, we don't track your locations when you're not using the app. The only locations we get are your observations. We don't really have the ability to do anything beyond that. Um, so you can feel safe doing that. And if you have a project, you can add that here. Um, it might not show up now. Um, if you set a default project, you won't have to go in and change it. It'll just be. Um, all set for you. I'll click off of that project for now. Um, and then there's this time searched button or time searched fields. Um, this is really important if you're doing a not detected record. Um, so if this, if this is blank for a not detected record, we don't really know if you just like glanced and didn't see it or if you like actually looked for it. Um, so you would like if you were on a trail and you looked for like 10 minutes, you would want to put 10 minutes here. And um, then you can put any more observation comments here. So you could say um, 
anything about the survey. Um, if you're looking for a jumping worm, you can say how you did it. Like, um, I visually inspected the soil or I looked under the leaf degree or something. Um, anything that isn't captured and you want to share with us, you can feel free to put that in observation comments. Um, and I'll actually show you, because if I pick, if I go up at the top and I pick species detected, there are some more optional fields that come up. So size of area containing invasive. So just visually estimate. Um, so if I see a patch of tree of heaven, I can estimate how many trees there are. I'll do the small one. And for distribution of invasive, um, you could pick trace, sparse, dense, monoculture, or linearly scattered. And so these are all just eyeball estimates. Um, like we're not expecting anyone to go out there with a, a tape measure or anything. It's just visually estimating how much plant there is. And so once everything looks the way you want it, at the bottom, you hit this save button. I might have done that too fast. Um, so I'll actually, I, I'll go back and to edit it. I click in the little pencil. And so there's a save button all the way at the bottom left. And so now your record will appear as a yellow card on your main screen. Um, that means it's on your phone. So it's not in the database yet. Um, so if you're out in the field, you keep collecting as many as you want. Um, you can also go back in to look at it to make sure it's right. Um, so there's that little pencil icon on the right side of the card. Um, but once you're back home or back somewhere where you have internet, um, you need to make sure to upload this record. So I'm going to put a check it right there. So under the little pencil icon, there's a checkbox. So I'm going to I'll unclick and click a few times so you can see it since you can't see my finger. Um, so click that checkbox. And then go up to the main menu again. So the three lines at the top left. And that'll bring up options. Um, so there's this upload selected button that I'm going to use. I'll also mention that if you have like 10 records, you don't want to go through and check the box for each one. You can also use this select all button and that'll select all of your records. And then upload selected. So the third option. I'll click that. It'll ask me if I'm sure. I'm sure. And then it'll give you this green success message. Success message. Um, and so now your screen should be blank. So a blank green screen that might look like your record disappeared, um, but really means that your record left your phone and went onto your onto the online database, which is good. And so. I think that's all I want to show you here. And one thing I will mention, um, I remember the first training, um, mine was, my card was red instead of yellow and it wouldn't let me upload the record. Um, so I just went back in to edit it and look at it and it turns out I never picked species. So if you ever have a red card, um, you just need to go back in and uh, hit the species. And yes, uh, Christine, the distribution fields don't pop up unless you are, unless it's, unless it's a detected species. All right, and so hopefully a lot of you have been able to upload records. So I'm going to go into the browser and uh, look at the records online. So this is what it looks like when you log in to IMAP Invasive. Um, turn it sideways so it looks a little bit more like a computer screen. Um, so on a tablet, the tools are collapsed into one button on the top right. But what I'll first do is I'll, I'll just zoom into the Adirondacks. 
So you can use the plus minus on the, the right, or you can drag screen. And so you see a ton of orange. Um, so this is the whole database. There's a ton, tons and tons of records, tons of species. Um, right now, I want to see these records that we just entered. So I'm going to filter on fake species. So I'm going to click tools on the top right. And one thing I should mention, um, once you've submitted your record and you have that blank screen, you're all set. You have reported to the database. What I'm showing you right now, this is just to show you that the data does go into the database. So this is just for your interest. It's not something you need to do. Um, so you don't need to follow along now. Um, so click tools on the top right. And I'm going to choose the filter tool. And there's a ton of things you can filter on. Um, project, organization, any species that you're interested in. I'm going to pick fake species. Switch to New York species list, actually. Fake species. And then I'm going to hit apply filter. And this is easier to see on a full computer screen. So when, if you, anyone wants to try it later. All right. And so right now, nothing's visible, but I think I actually know why that is. So Go into open layers. So on the right, it's open layers. So these are the geographic layers. One thing I always need to check is what layers are actually showing. Um, so right now it's showing confirmed. So I'm going to toggle on unconfirmed. And I'm also going to toggle on not detected so that these will appear. Still not seeing any. It's just strange. Let me see if store filters, fake species. Did anyone have problems uploading? Maybe I'll switch to my computer now. See if we can see it there. <laughs> Let me refresh the map. And that will just take a second. Oh, uh, now they're popping up. Great. Maybe my tablet didn't have good internet connection or something. Oops. Give that a second. It's my computer sometimes a little bit slow when it's trying to do internet while it's on a WebEx call or on a Zoom call. Um, and I do see a question um, whether you can add observations directly from the browser instead of the app. The answer is yes. Um, once this loads, I will show you how to do that really briefly. Okay, that's just going to take a second to load. So while we're waiting, I'll actually show you. Um, so if you go onto the IMAP website, um, there will always be this banner on the top. And so I have this link for the fifth annual invasive species mapping challenge. Um, so that will bring you to this page below, which has the leaderboard. So it has the winners for or the, the leader, the current leaders for each species in terms of individuals and prisms. Um, so as you can see, um, 
there's a different amount for each species, but for example, for jumping worms, um, the prism, the winning prism is the capital region. They only have three records. So if everyone on this call went out and did a survey, like uh, APIP would be at the top of the leaderboard. Um, another example would be water chestnut. So if anyone does more than one record, they would be at the top of the leaderboard. So this is anyone's challenge at this point. Um, I encourage you all to participate and uh, see your name and your prism rise up to the top. Um, and oh, I also show you on this web page. Scroll down. Um, the points pop up here as they're recorded, and also below this, I have some really basic instructions. And I have embedded our YouTube video on the mapping challenge. So if you click on this, this is where you'll see a presentation on each of the species, including the presentation from Dr. Anis Dobson on uh, jumping worm. Um, there's also really cool presentations on Tree of Heaven and frog bit. Um, we, and I will eventually be posting something on water chestnut as well. Let's see if the map has started to load. Cool. So I'm happy to see some observations popping up. And I see there's one down in Connecticut. That's cool. I, yeah, I saw one of you is in northeastern Connecticut. Um, and so to if you wanted to create a record right in here. Um, so say it's an observation, it's a place that you already know there's a species there, maybe it's a pond in your backyard or something. Um, there's this create record button all the way at the top. So if you click that, um, you can choose what you're recording. So presence, um, treatment. Um, if you have like a pond in your backyard with water chestnut and you pull it out, you could enter a treatment record. Um, if you, if you surveyed an area and it's not there, you can do not detected. Um, if you surveyed like a park or some property and you found a couple, um, you could do this multi-record search area. So you could draw a polygon around the area you searched and put in points or polygons where you found species. Um, and since you could do this on your phone if you have internet connection, like if you're out in the field, if you have internet connection, you could do this. Um, but a lot of the times this would be something you'd be doing at home. So you'd be like tracing the satellite imagery. So if you want to change the satellite imagery, you go to this change base maps at the top and you could choose satellite. Like if you wanted to trace a pond or something. Um, so this, Website allows you to do polygons and lines while the app only does points, but still the, the app is generally preferable um, because you can use out in the field. So you can record the species as you see it rather than uh, taking a picture and then going back home and then reporting it. Um, I think I did see a comment that some of you, let me see if I can find it. Oh, so the the Vic people have been doing a bunch of invasive species removal. Um, if any of you are interested in, um, we do have some tools that we've made for other professionals. Like um, if you want to be able to record polygons um, and treatments and stuff, um, you can use online rather than the app. And we also have these other apps that we've developed um, so there's IMAP Mobile Advanced. So it's another mobile app, but it allows you to record some more advanced data. So feel free to email me if you want to learn more about that. I would say that um, this, this desktop feature, I've definitely used um, and will continue to use like when I'm driving, for instance, and I, I know I've got the identification skills I know what exit it was at. I mentally 
noted like the mile marker and the, the wetland but I, I should not stop driving and I need to get where I'm going. And so I've used this to enter in information that way and drawing a shape, but I have the confidence level um, for to do that. And if you don't feel that way, you don't have to, but there's a lot of different ways as Mitchell is saying to use this app mm -hmm. and the desktop version. Mm -hmm. And you can always enter anything into comments as well, any information on how you're observing the species or um, the story for why you're using the desktop or whatever. Um, so I was, so there's, if you're interested, there are all sorts of tools that you can use on here. This is all if you're interested. Um, so you can do the export report tool, if you switch to report, you can run a report. So um, you could do infested area that calculates like how much area is infested by an invasive species. Um, you can do species list by geography. So you could um, select your county and it'll show you all the species that have been found in your county. Um, and one thing you could also do for species list by geography, if you had filtered your if you had been in the filter tool first and filtered on your records, I'll show you how to do that real quick. Filter records, and there's this toggle for filter on your records. Um, so that's one way to see a map of your records, which can be cool sometimes. Um, you can also make a little report. Once you're filtered on your records, and you go back into the export report tool, you could make a report for species list and you would see all of your records that you reported. So that's just something to do for fun if you're interested. Um, Mitchell, did you see the question in the box? No. The question is, can you reiterate how to join the invasive species mapping challenge? Oh yeah. Um, so we we actually didn't make a project in IMAP Invasive, so you don't have to join a project. Um, so the way to participate is to just um, make observations of those four species. So um, they're listed. You can look at the leaderboard. So it's jumping worms, tree of heaven, water chestnut, European frog bit. Um, so any any observation um, in New York in the three week time span will be included in the challenge. Um, let's see. And so I was going to show you a couple of species distributions. I think I'll just show one since my internet's a little bit slower than expected. Um, so this filter records, I used it to show fake species, CR uh, records that we've submitted. Um, but it's also a really great way to look at species distribution. So take any species you're interested in. Um, I'm going to do hemlock, woolly, adelgid. And I'm gonna, I had a date filter on there. So I, you can also filter on dates. That's how I look at just the challenge observations. But I want to see all of the hemlock woolly adelgid records. And that will probably take a second to think. Oh, one thing that helps sometimes is if I change the base map to a simple base map like light gray, things usually load faster. And if you try this after the webinar, it'll probably be going faster for you. It's just because I'm also in Zoom right now. I'll just take a minute.
Can I add how IMAP is helping us with applied research with Hemlock Woody Adilgid, Mitchell? Yes, yeah, that would be great to mention. So before the data pulls up, um, I'll say that Hemlock Woody Adilgid, if you're not familiar with it, is an insect um, that like other species as climate changes in North America, the insects range is changing and the way they lay their eggs, um, they create this foamy, like white fuzzy substance to keep them protected. And those eggs and the adults tend to feed and damage um, the structure, the cellular structure of hemlock trees, which is predominantly what makes up our conifer forest here in the Adirondacks. Um, and so it's a species that is present throughout the Appalachian chain. So you'll see it in Tennessee, you'll see it in Pennsylvania, it's in southern reaches of New York, um, and we're the, up, we're the northernmost presence of this insect. So we know it will be coming, and we know that because we have this distribution map using IMAP, um, and so to prepare for it, we're testing right now, um, it's brand new, we're testing a, APIP is testing a biocontrol. So another insect that can destroy hemlock woody adulted. It'll pr predate on it, it'll eat the eggs. So since we're the coldest, most, but also most humid area in the summer, um, researchers are trying to see if these insects are going to survive over the winter. Um, not the hemlock woody adulgent insects, but the insects used to, to eat their eggs. Um, so this summer and winter, we're starting our first test to see if the larva of the biocontrol can survive our winters. Um, so that's the beginning of being prepared, having a plan for if this um, pest, this forest pathogen comes to the Adirondacks, we want to know what tools we have to combat it. Um, if we were to lose huge swaths of our hemlock forest, the ecosystem would be forever changed. So because of IMAP, we know how to do, how to design this project. And my computer is struggling to do this, so I'm going to switch back to the tablet real quick. Thank you for your patience. So this is filtered on uh, hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, so the orange, it's, okay, there we go. So the orange are places where it's been found. Um, there's, so it's been pretty prevalent in the southern part of the state and sort of the southern Finger Lakes region. Um, but you can see there's these yellow points, which are not detected records. So the orange is where it has been found. The yellow points are where it's been surveyed for, but not found. So the northern part of the state, pretty much APIP and Slilo, the St. Lawrence Lake Ontario prism, um, are these last areas in New York State which are which have not been infested by HWA. Um, and these are also areas where there is a lot of hemlock to be concerned about. Um, and the idea is that we want to keep it that way. We don't want to transport HWA from the south to the north. Um, one thing I will note is that there was one presence in the southern part of APIP. So you can see this presence record. As you zoom in, it'll turn into points. So there's a green point, which means presence record. So right near Lake George. Um, but since APIP is awesome, they found it, they made a record, and then I'll also show you where the treatment is. So there's this little brown treatment. So the record, so this infestation was treated. So even though it was found in the Adirondacks once, it was treated and since then it has not been found again, I believe. Um, 
so the distribution has not spread to uh, the Adirondacks yet. And so you can, if you're interested in where different species are, you can go in here and filter on different species. And one pattern I think you'll see a lot is that it is found more in southern and western parts of the state and not found very much in the Adirondacks. But that's definitely not true for all species. So there are certainly species that are in the Adirondacks that are have been found there and need to be contained. Um, but there are a lot of species that we can still prevent or eradicate as well. Um, I think I'll just show this one for now. So now I'll go back to my presentation. Just for some conclusion. All right, let me just scroll through this real quick. So one last thing I want comment I want to make on the app. So this slide reiterates that um, if you have a card on your app, that means it's on your phone. It's not in the database. Um, you need to get it onto the database. And then once your screen is empty, uh, that means you're successful and you, all of your records are on the database. And so it's really important um, that the pictures you take are in focus and close up. Um, so these photos are how experts confirm your observations. So they need to go in and look at the photo, see if it matches the species ID that you've selected, and then they can press confirmed and it can be a confirmed record in our database. And so the pictures on the left, they're of hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, so there's these white woolly masses um, at the bases of the leaves. Um, that's uh, the telltale sign of HWA. Um, but in this picture, since it's so blurry, it's kind of hard to tell. So you can't really tell if it's snow or spider webs. Um, and then on the right, I have an example of a much clearer photo. So on this one, it's in focus. It's clear, and if you zoom in, you can see the white woolly masses more clearly. So it's really important that your pictures are focused and close enough on the species where you can see an identifying feature. And um, some tips we have are putting your hands behind it. Um, you can put a piece of paper behind it for a blank background, just something to give some scale and uh, um, allow the camera to focus. And so leads your app to the online web application. And then there's all sorts of things you can do on the web application, like filtering for species, viewing different layers, so not detected versus presences, um, et cetera. And I will mention that make sure you're using one of these three recommended browsers, not Internet Explorer. And then if you ever need help, well, one, there's the NY IMAP help desk. So you can email this address IMAP invasive at dec.ny.gov, and that will go to me, and then I can help you. Um, or you can go online. So on our NY IMAP invasive website, we have a lot of resources. Um, there's a link to our YouTube channel where you can view past webinars. Um, and then the IMAP invasive network, so all the states in the Canadian province, have a website as well, and they have help documents there as well. So if you're uh, confused, having an issue, uh, go on to Google and Google IMAP Invasive, and you'll be able to find some resources on these two websites. And with that, I just want to thank everyone for joining and for your interest in IMAP Invasive and helping out the Adirondacks. Um, we encourage you to go out and submit a record this weekend. Um, it's great to do it while it's still fresh in your mind. Um, you could also, because the challenge is going on right now, some good species to look for would be these four. And you'll also hear some more species to look out for from Emily Bell later.
And we hope you stay connected with IMAP Invasive. So you can follow us on our Facebook or Instagram accounts at NYIMAP Invasive. And um, I think we're leaving questions for after, right, Emily? Am I going to turn it to you at this point? Well, we, I have one more question to confirm with you, and we've kind of been going through throughout, and we're getting close to time. So if there's also bigger questions, I'm happy to stay late and answer those. Um, I'd love to have more questions. So the first, the one question I'm going to ask you, just to confirm, because I'm still learning, um, is just to confirm, pulling up the distribution maps, still needs to happen on a web browser. So either back on a desktop or come outside of the app on your phone and go to your phone's web browser. Is that yeah. correct? Yep. Okay. If we and have also, like Google money, we could, you know, put that all into the app probably, but I'm guessing it's a lot of processing power. And so since this app is created and used and made by research scientists and academics and conservation professionals and citizen scientists, that processing power is a little outside of our capacity. Is that correct, Mitchell? Yeah, and it would um, it would be, since we really wanted the app to be usable in areas without connectivity, so there would be all sorts of errors um, and functions not working if we had all of that capability in the app. Um, and one other thing I'll mention though is when you submit your record in that success box, there is a little link that says um, like log into IMAP Invasive to view your record. So you can click on that and it will bring you um, to IMAP Invasive. It'll just do it through your browser. So you can like get to it through your app, but you can't get to that within your app. Great. Well, thank you, Mitchell. I'm, yeah, I was just going to mention I can stay after for questions as well, so we can go to your part now. Okay, great. I'll share my screen. Thanks, everyone. So hold on, because we're going to go into a couple more um, species. Okay. I've had to change rooms, I'm so sorry. There was a little construction noise. So if you're hearing some echo, I apologize. So in follow-up for all of you, I want everyone, so one of my backgrounds is just teaching people how to identify plants. So what my graduate research was on, it's been really my life's work, is talking to people about how to identify plants and animals. Um, and working on a field guide for you all is a long-term goal of mine. Um, and currently, and um, really for this challenge and for you to all be prepared to go out in the field, I'm going to follow up as soon as possible, like before middle of next week, with identification materials so that you know what to go out into the field looking for in terrestrial and aquatic habitats. So those four species that Mitchell mentioned, water, chestnut, jumping worm, European frogbit, tree of heaven. I'll be sending you visual materials and with a little bit of written, you know, cues, kind of like a field guide, but I'll also be sending you links to webinars that have been referenced throughout today if you want to jump in and start really getting the nitty gritty of all those details. Um, the jumping worm workshops, I have to say, they're all really interesting and cool, and there's a lot to look out for of why they're different than earth, regular earthworms. There's also two top terrestrial species that are in bloom right now that I want to mention. The first one is yellow flag iris. Um, I say in bloom because this is a really good time. When something is blooming, that's the best time to go find it. This plant is so vibrant, so bright, so neon yellow that it will pop out at you from across the landscape. The rest of the time, um, it might just sort of look like a large iris. It might look like a cattail. It might look like, um, 
hard to explain, but I think a cattail is a native cattail is what it would be most easily confused with. So these plants, why, how to tell the difference between these irises, which were introduced from Europe as a horticultural spe specimen versus um, irises that we don't consider problematic species. We don't consider them invasive. They're just garden plants or native occurring um, is their sheer size. These things grow to be two to three. I've seen them out in Oregon where everything grows bigger. They've been my height and I'm like five, seven. Um, they'll grow in wet areas. So you'll see them along lake sides, in drainage ditches, uh, in wetlands, which we have many, many, many of, and they're really important habitats and carbon sinks that are irreplaceable. Their leaves have a real flat, um, fan-like structure to them, whereas a native cattail growing in a similar wet habitat will have a really round stalk where everything branches out from the top, or at least a few feet off the ground. These guys really fan out like a giant, um, like a giant iris that's super flat with long leaves that are sharp at the edges. The flowers are an intense yellow, like think big bird yellow. There's a lot of garden variety irises that people plant and have sort of naturalized a little bit in the Adirondacks that are more of a buttery color, a little less of a bright hue. The other thing to look out for if they've already passed their peak of flowering are really long seed pods. Seed pods can grow to be, I wanna say two to six inches long. Um, an easy way to help slow seed production is if you do identify this plant, pop off those seed pods, bring them with you, and put them in the garbage. Um, but once the seed pods lower down, we see these green ones. Those are fresh and they're still maturing. They're going to dry out and start to split. These three-part capsules split to reveal these bright, like neon bright orange seed coverings. That's their fruit. Um, and a few stages later, once they dry out, those seed pods or those seeds just become black and very, very shiny. Um, these guys spread by rhizomes. Uh, rhizomes break and stay in the soil, and it's how they will really spread and colonize an entire stream bank, a riparian area, a wetland. Um, Think of a rhizome as like a large ginger you might buy at the supermarket. So this is a top plant to look out for right now. If you see it, please map it and let's keep an eye on it. This is an early detect rapid response species in wetlands and wet areas. So your help is greatly needed. Japanese tree lilac, we believe is not super present in the Adirondacks, but we really want to keep an eye on it. It's a slow growing shrub or small sized tree. They're related to, they're, they're part of the lilac family, which we know are a common um, garden plant in the Adirondacks that can really tolerate our cold winters and love our warm, wet summers. The difference between, um, say the purple horticultural lilacs you see on the landscape and these shrubs or small trees is there they have these big white fluffy airy uh, flowers rather than the tight clustered purple ones they also don't smell very good um, I'm honestly really not sure why people plant these at all and I'm going to follow up with a lot more detail about these I want to just give an overview so that you can be prepared and I'll follow up because I know we're going short on time a lot of our aquatic plants are out there and kind of like getting ready to leaf out. So these are, a lot of these, maybe European frog, but you'll see if we have it, but these are gonna be more prevalent in late July and August. So we have a way to connect you to already be prepared and out there and volunteer to survey lakes before these plants are really coming into their own. So that brings me to our next point, which is, well, these are different stages of containment suppression and eradication, but 
volunteers are needed, not just in using IMAP, but in very specific lake surveys. So this is something I'm gonna include in my follow-up email to all of you, is, is a long list of lakes that you might be living on and you don't know, or you might vacation to, or you might hike around, or you might just really enjoy visiting. We have a number of different protocols that we would train you on. We have data sheets that we would deliver to you. We can help you find all the materials needed and understand what to be aware of. Um, and we'll prepare you to understand how to do all of this monitoring. And it's really fun. Um, I might go do this myself with my family next week because we'll be on a leak that I know needs attention. So this is, I have a two part list of all the lakes we're gonna survey this summer. So this will be part of the follow-up and I want you to just sort of look at this list, think about it, and potentially get involved. Um, here's part two. So I know I'm going through this quickly. So this will all be part of the follow-up. Um, in fact, I'll probably send you all this list as well as a number of recorded webinars and add you all to IMAP um, projects. And APIP has really just one project, one general volunteer project that we add folks to, because um, I've gotten a couple questions regarding that. However, if, you're, if you wanna jump in and join a specific lake survey, that's when we sort of separate you out in, in IMAP invasives, if that is helpful information. So this is part of stuff I'll send you as soon as possible, whereas our bigger bloom calendar and you know species to look out for and identifying factors is something I'll be sending you next week. So we've got an action plan and we've discussed all these different points throughout the workshop, but part of that might also be joining us for another workshop. So this is something I'll be sending you as well next week. Uh, we have a lot of fun workshops coming up and they'll all be recorded in case you can't make it or you just want to use as reference materials or you want to brush up on your species identification. Um, we'll have a family workshop on the 28th digitally for safe social distancing, but there will also be hands-on activities in a safe distance manner at the VIC later this summer. We're gonna have a panel for managing milfoil for lake associations coming up in early August. Um, it's a lot of fun stuff and we're building our education calendar, so I hope you can join us. Um, if there's any pressing questions, we can jump to that in just a minute. And I'll just put up our contact info here. Uh, we've got our website with lots of resources on it, our Facebook and our Instagram. So without any further ado, I know I just did all of that plan identification in like eight minutes, so I'm sorry. Um, we can open this up to questions and answers. Whoops, I'm sorry. My sharing screen stopped. Okay, do you have any questions? Well, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I uh, have a question on uh, IMAPs. I used it in the past. And when I go out in the field with my phone, I would take various pictures for a given spot because it was suggested that you take like a general area picture so when people get there they could see the general area that they were going to and then take several pictures that would be close up for identification so on and so forth and then i go to various places along say the stream and take pictures of different spots and then when i return home i would upload it to the computer and they would be uploaded as separate records. And then I would take those pictures and put them into various boxes and IMAP so that they would know, you know, this is the one for the general area, so on and so forth. Is that still the same? Because when I tried uploading that fake one, 
It looked like it uploaded off of my phone, but it never popped up on my screen. Great. So um, we are working on, in the future, having it be able to, you could take multiple pictures for one record. Right now, it's one picture per record. Um, so, so is that a change? Because that's what I used to do. I'm not sure. I I'm, I started a few months ago, so I'm actually not sure what it was. A few years ago. It for, for like ten years or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. So it it is often useful to take multiple pictures. Like if you want to take the picture of the full plant, and then like maybe zoom in on an identifying feature or something. Um, so if you do have multiple pictures, um, so what you can do is um, take the best picture you can um, while you're out in the field, record the record with just that one picture. Um, and then if you want to add in more pictures, you would have to go back in online, find your record, and then add the pictures there. Um, so there isn't, we are working on to try to make that easier so you could just take like a bunch of pictures, but that's not um, active yet. Um, and if you ever have issues, you can always email pictures to the IMAP email or anything like that. Okay. Uh, so when I tried uploading it this time, I couldn't find it on the screen. And I even went back just to look to find some of my old records from like, you know, two years ago. And it didn't seem to want to pull anything up. It seems that I'm logged on and everything. It finds my information. Mm -hmm. So you would have to log in to IMAP, but so go on to your browser to IMAP Invasive and then filter records. And then you could put in your, oh, you could just toggle this filter on your records. That's what I, that's what I tried to do when okay. it gave a date to search, you know, and when I clicked on the date, when I saw your date, it had like MMM slash DDD slash year type of thing. Mine just came up with mm -hmm. a blank, and when I tried to type in a date, didn't accept anything so okay if you want to look at your records for all time you don't have to put in a date the default is just to show all the records this is if you wanted to only see records like before a certain date um i'm not sure exactly why you weren't able to enter a date uh, what browser were you using uh, i'm on an apple uh, mac okay so probably Safari? Yes. So I can do some testing on Safari to see if there's an issue there. Oh, some stuff, um, just, but, I, some stuff just popped up. It just took a long time. I see them all, okay. all listed down here. I'm not sure if that's all of them. But <laughs> that's mm. a whole bunch. All right. Mm. And one thing to also make sure is um, Oh, I just realized I'm not sharing my screen right now. <laughs> but um, on the right side of um, on the right side of IMAP Invasive, there's those geographic layers, and so layers on off. Um, I oftentimes I'm filtering on something and then I can't see it, and it's because I forgot to turn on the right layers. So just make sure you have unconfirmed turned on so that your records that haven't been confirmed also pop up because some records do take a while to confirm. Okay, all right. Well, I found a bunch of old records now have actually finally piled, come up on the screen. The internet here is really slow. So mm. I'm up the lake and uh, okay. Well, so maybe I forgot, maybe it was that I could only upload one picture and then later on I had to come in and put more. You know, it's been a, it's mm. been like over a year since I've done it. So, mm -hmm. okay, All right. Well, maybe it looks like it's working okay now that it's actually popped up. Cool. Okay. If not, I should call you. Right? I've got your email. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Bring me back. Up You're welcome. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Do we have additional questions? Feel free to unmute. And Mitchell, if you need to share the screen, we can do that too. Okay, thanks. Whoops, big old screen. Whoops. Whoops.
Oops. I'm doing very badly right now. I had to switch over from um I don't need to share it right now. That's what you're trying to do. Hey, I have a question for everyone. Um, would it be helpful if in the materials I send out um, that that would include a list of species in the Adirondacks for you to add, to know to add in IMAP? Yeah, okay. That will be created then. Um, I'll also mention that um, on our new website, um, on our new website, I'll go to that right now. There's a way for you to also upload a photo if you need to ask a PIP a question. Photos. Okay. So our website is still adkinvasives.com. I'm not sure why we're a .com, but if you go to, I think it's actually at the bottom, just quickly, always at the bottom, it says contact us. And none of us are working from our office right now, so email is the best way to get at all of us, and you can directly email us through the website. I built the website, and I love hummingbirds, and so you're gonna see hummingbirds everywhere. They're really important and wonderful. Um, so in our contact sheet, you know, you can select something about, you know, a kind of gears towards what you're asking. Is it in the water? Is it on land? Is it about education? And then at the bottom here, you can choose a photo. So even if you're just gonna send me photos of hummingbirds and you need a question about it, I can direct you. Um, We're seeing your um, PowerPoint, by the way. I don't know oh, if you're you trying to show the website. I'm definitely trying to show the website. <laughs> um, well, I'll send it out as a link and a follow up. Um, and everybody, it's pretty self explanatory. So I think it should be okay. So, without further ado, um, I will be sending out more volunteer information and plant identification information and all of our contact information, as well as recordings and links to this and past workshops that'll help you get, get going with IMAP in the field. Okay, well, thank you guys so much. And Mitch, I'll get this recording from you later. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Thanks everyone. I'm gonna sign off. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.